So dear friends, welcome to our first uh, presentation of uh, the video that is uh, focused on deepening our understanding of mission. I want to thank John Stevens, who is the uh, presenter and uh, who has been working uh, with many of you, especially with our young people, to try to get across what it means to have a mission and what becoming a missionary church and people entails. Uh, he's going to share with us his ideas uh, in this video. And uh, in and through his experiences, he is inviting us uh, to have one purpose in mind, and that is to get as many of you as possible uh, to talk to each other. That's the point of this uh, video series. Now in the first part, uh, the point to consider is the challenge of sharing Christ with others. Now that's the phrase, sharing Christ with others. That's the mission. But what does it mean? What's involved? Two things struck me uh, are that John speaks about go and tell and come and see. I think all of you have something to share. Now, are you going to go and tell others about it? Our parishes and communities also have something to share, but they need to come and see what's available. But I get a little concerned there, because when people come to our parishes, um, what would they see? Now, in your parish, what is being offered to others that's of interest? What could someone be brought to see in your, in your experience of parish life? Mission is not just about telling others about Christ. It's also about doing uh, something for Christ. Our refugee crisis has demonstrated that. Uh, mission is action. And so, in a second instance, uh, John's going to talk about mission and ministry. I'd like to say that mission is ministry. The ministry is caring for others. That's the second point that we're trying to make here. Ministry as caring for others. In this year of mercy, we are rediscovering the corporal works of mercy. If you don't know what these are, again, I uh, go and find out. Uh, you might discover there something that's really essential and important. Words, actions, that's okay. But there is also a need to have convincing words and effective actions. And there won't be either of these if there isn't also the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's the third point that's being dis discussed here. The third element of a missionary uh, disciple who is going to be effective in his actions is that that person be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and be able to rely on it. Remember your confirmation? You receive seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's time to review them 
and uh, perhaps to reactivate them and thus allow the power of the Holy Spirit to change you as the Holy Spirit did when the Holy Spirit came upon the first disciples in the church. I have on occasion made the point that the Holy Spirit isn't just about tongues of fire on your head, but it's about a burning fire in your heart, the fire of love. Mission is not impossible, but it requires what only the Spirit can give, and that is insight, freedom, and courage. Is your parish an assembly of Spirit-filled disciples of Christ or not? This is what this video is intended to get you to reflect on and may you have a good conversation. So welcome. Mission is the first topic that we want to cover from the Archbishop's pastoral letter. Mission, community, and formation. Why start with mission? I think it's important to start with mission because without mission, we don't really have a purpose. And community without a purpose is just a club. And formation without a goal is just trivia. And so it's very important for us to consider mission because it's what we're about. It's who we're supposed to be. And the bishop divides mission into three aspects or categories. Sharing Christ with others, ministry to those in need, and reliance on the Spirit. So let's take a little bit of time to talk about that first aspect of mission, sharing Christ with others. You know, and, and what does it mean to share Christ with others? Well, I think it's our first mission. It's the mission of the church is to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Just before he goes up to heaven, Jesus gives us what's called the Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. And so the first part, sharing Christ with others, is that go make disciples part of the Great Commission. You know, there's the baptize part of the Great Commission, and there's the teaching part of the Great Commission, but the go make disciples part is the mission part that we need to, I think, recapture in our time and place. Pope Francis says that it's, it's these verses where we see how the risen Christ sends his followers to preach the gospel in every time and place so that faith in him might be spread to every corner of the earth. The Pope goes on to say, and he quotes John Paul II here saying, like, there must be no lessening of this impetus to preach the gospel. Like this, this desire, this, this urgency to preach the gospel cannot be lessened because it is the first and primary task of the church. Way back with Paul VI, right after the Second Vatican Council, he says that the church exists to evangelize, that it's her deepest vocation and identity. So mission is who we are. Without our mission, why do we gather and what do we teach? So mission is the most important thing. And the essential element of mission, the first element of mission is sharing Christ with others. Go make disciples. And in our, in our time and place, maybe we need to recapture that a little bit because I think that for the longest time with uh, Catholics, you didn't have to do much to make disciples. You just had to basically reproduce, right? Making disciples was just making babies. And then you took them to church and you had them baptized and they were taught in the school or they were taught by the parish or they were taught by somebody else. And so the making disciples process was pretty straightforward and a little bit fun, you know, but the... The world has turned, the world has changed, and we know that that just doesn't work anymore. You know, that, that the machinery that produced those disciples somewhere along the way got gummed up. And we need to get back to this making disciples part. And the core of making disciples is learning again how to share the ministry message and mission of Jesus Christ with other people. And we all have to recapture it personally and communally. And that's an important aspect, I think, of sharing Christ with others. Whose job is it? Because I think sometimes we have a sense that, that we could uh, just leave that off to professionals. Interestingly, I was listening to a podcast the other day about innovation in companies. And I swear, you could just have said, every time the guy says innovation, put in the word evangelization. 
And, and it would have been a perfect talk for, for one of us or something like that. And one of the things that he said is a sign that innovation is not working in a company is when they appoint somebody like a chief innovation officer or a special innovation team. And the reason for that is as soon as it's one person's job, it's not my job. And so evangelization is everybody's responsibility. Pope Francis says in The Joy of the Gospel that by virtue of our baptism, all are called to preach the gospel. All of us. And sometimes I think we have a tendency to professionalize things. We used to do that, I think, a lot when we had a lot of clergy and religious. We don't have those now. But so we're looking maybe to employees or to a person or to that guy who's on the video. He's pretty smart. Let him do it. You know, but... It's all of our responsibility. And Pope Francis says, as we seek this profound missionary renewal, there's a kind of preaching that falls to each of us every day. And he said that's in conversation, it's in the marketplace, it's in the city square, it's in the bank. It's these places of encounter where we see other people. So if we're going to share Christ with others in these contexts, and we all have a responsibility for it, what tools do we need to be able to do that? And I think that that's what the bishop is trying to, to get at in his uh, pastoral letter. When he talks about things, if you, if you look at the little survey that he has uh, at the end of this session, you know, it'll ask questions like, people regularly share testimony in our parish. You know? Our parish has a ministry designed to welcome new people and introduce them to Jesus. We have great hospitality. We have to share Christ with others. We have to learn the skills uh, again to how to be doing that. And so I would say that the first skill is, is to testimony. Actually, I would even back it up and say witness comes first. Witness is living our lives in such a way that we're actually interesting. You know? that, that we take the gospel seriously and it has an impact on our lives. And usually, I find in today's world, that would manifest itself by joy. Because you know, when you're walking down the street, how many happy people do you actually see? You know? How many times do you ask somebody, how are you doing? They go, huh, okay, we're busy, you know, or, or something like that. Well, it's all right, but, you know. So joyful people are interesting people. They're either crazy or they've got something right. And so our witness of our lives is the first tool that we need to recapture if we're going to share Christ with other people. What does that look like, that witness of our life? Well, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Self-control. Paul lists them in his letter to the Galatians. They're signs that we're living in the Spirit. And so the witness of our life will hopefully prompt conversation. And if it prompts conversation, then the next thing we need to be able to be good at is testimony. Because testimony is telling another person my story of how Jesus has changed my life. And so you see in the, in the little survey that people do, you know, our parish regularly has testimony as part of our liturgies and meetings and gatherings. You know. Why? So that we can learn the skill of talking to other people and get the practice of talking to other people about how Jesus actually changed our life and how he's worked. Lots of us probably have instances or stories or experiences that we could share, but we've never shared them with another human being, you know. And so we need the practice of doing that. So witness leads us to testimony. And from testimony leads us to proclamation. And that's being able to tell the story from the gospel of Jesus clearly and simply so that people can have a chance to respond. But sometimes we're not ready for proclamation or maybe somebody isn't quite ready to hear a proclamation. And so it could also be invitation. And so we see this in the gospel, these two forms of introducing people to Christ. We see a go and tell. So I go to somebody and I tell them about the good things that God is doing in my life. And there's a come and see. And I think we need to have both. It's not either or. I think we need to have the skills to be able to tell other people about Jesus, to go and tell. But I think in our parish communities especially, we have to have the ability to say, come and see. And what would people come and see in our parishes? I think this is the practical implication of this section of sharing Christ with others. What does it look like, practically speaking? Well, does our parish have a place where somebody who doesn't know Jesus could come and meet him and learn more about him? And that's not liturgical. You know, the liturgy is, is beautiful and wonderful and important, but it's, it's kind of the end point. You know, 
everything in conversion leads up towards it. The catechism says that the liturgy doesn't exhaust all the activity of the church, but it must be preceded by faith, conversion, and charity so that people can receive the benefit that it, it gives. So what are we doing to introduce faith, conversion, and charity into our parishes? Do we have a place where if today I came to you and you came to me and said, I'd like to learn more about God. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. Would there be a place where I could invite you to? Does our parish have a come and see? Does our parish teach people to go and tell by helping them practice their testimony, by encouraging them in the witness of their life? I think if we can develop this practice, this double notion of go and tell and come and see, these two aspects of evangelization. I think if we can develop those in our parishes in practical ways, opportunities where I can invite you in and you can encounter the Lord, and opportunities where I can learn and practice the skills of sharing my faith with another person, that would be a huge change in the way that we spend our time and our formation efforts and our activity levels in our parishes. And if we can do that, I think we will accomplish this aspect of the mission, sharing Christ with others. So take a few minutes in your small group and see if you can work that out for your own parish. The second aspect of mission that the bishop focuses on in his pastoral letter is ministry to those in need. This is the obeying everything I have commanded you part of the gospel commission, the great commission. Because this is where the, the action happens. This is where the witness of our life is really lived out, is in ministry to those in need. If I could define this one section, especially in this great jubilee year, in one word, that word would be mercy. This year, with the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, Pope Francis tells us that mercy is the beating heart of the gospel. Let's think about it. The, the heart is what beats life into everything else. So if we're not being merciful, if we're not serving those in need, then we're not doing our mission. Our mission has no, no life in it. Our, our proclamation, our words, our sharing Christ with others, they're kind of just words without the action and activity of mercy and ministry to those in need. Pope Francis said in the joy of the gospel that an evangelizing community, so people who are about the mission, gets involved by word and deed in people's lives daily. And we have to do that. Ministry to those in need is getting involved by words and deeds in people's lives daily. And it helps us to bridge distances. In fact, he says that, that the church should be just like Jesus and should go to everybody. Go out to the, uh, everyone without exception. Which is important too because I think that that means ministry to those in need isn't ministry to those in our church. It's ministry to those who are outside our church. And it brings us back to the go of the go make disciples in the Great Commission. We must get outside of ourselves because our ministry of mercy is what bridges what we have to bring to the outside world. It's where we get in the mix and get engaged and get dirty, as the Pope likes to say sometimes, in the world. And so ministry to those in need is the concrete expression of mercy in our parishes. We do spend a lot of time in our parishes uh, serving the poor and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and sheltering the shelterless and all those other corporeal works of mercy. But do we do it with the mission in mind? Do we see it as, a, as an expression of a relationship with Jesus that, that just forces us, just impels us to share uh, his love with other people, both in word and in the way that we act? And I think we see that right now, you, you know, in the refugee crisis that's, that's striking the world, you know? That, that in our parishes, people are coming together and saying, we want to do something about this. And we're going well outside the boundaries and walls of our parishes. And when we say we're setting up a group uh, to, to help bring a, a refugee family over from Syria or some other place, 
Other people in the community go, whoa, I want to get involved in that. And other people outside who would never darken the doors of our church come and get involved. Money that, that people wouldn't normally give to our church because they're not there every week comes in for these, uh, for these services and for these projects. And think about that. Think about every great need there is in the world and every great need that there is in every one of our communities. And if we had approached it with that same just get up and go that we've been doing uh, for this refugee crisis. You know, whether that be uh, poor families in our parish, whether that be, um, you know, the Pope just came out with an environmental encyclical, environmental issues. You know, we've got uh, sick and dying is on the radar screen with bills about euthanasia in the, in the news and in, in the legislature. We have all kinds of opportunities to go outside of ourselves and be in the mix, in the world, bringing the mercy of God to people who need it. And it's in seeing this mercy of the God that people are inspired and find once more the road to the Father. That's what Pope Francis said. So ministry to those in need is an important aspect of our overall mission. I think sometimes people hold these things in conflict or intention, that we must either be about proclamation, about going out and telling people about Jesus, or we are only about... Uh, ministry to those in need. We're only about serving the poor. We're only about doing that kind of stuff. But they go together. They're two sides of the same coin. And John Paul II said that about missionary activity and holiness. I believe that about missionary activity, about proclamation and ministry to those in need. Our witness is incomplete, one without the other. And I think it's very important that we zero in on that in our parishes and ask ourselves, what are we doing to serve those in need in our community. The question on the survey that, that is there is our parish spends a significant amount of time and it asks about feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, giving clothes to the naked, harboring the harborless, you know, taking in refugees, people needing sanctuary, visiting the sick, ransoming the captive, visiting the captive, and burying the dead. And all these are issues that are, that are everywhere in our community when we see that people are isolated and alone and in need. And mercy, the beating heart of the gospel, puts life into our message that we go outside of our own doors and do something about it. And so what are we doing in our parishes that is a concrete expression of mercy? What are we doing that we're going out and doing because there is a need there and we heard in the gospel that wherever you see these, the least of my brothers, you do for me. You see me. That's what Jesus says. Where do we see that? And what are we doing about it? And how much are we really committed to it? How much of our time? How much of our money? How much of our talent? How much of that is going to serving those outside the walls of our community because they have a need to serve? And how much of that, when it is happening, is driven by a life-changing relationship with Christ rather than just the right thing to do? Because I think the only thing that separates us from a non-governmental organization, the Pope always says this, the church is not an NGO. You know, we don't just do good things because they happen to be good. We do good things because we have experienced the mercy of the Father through Jesus Christ, and we are required and pro you know, just propelled to share that mercy with other people. That's one of the jobs of the church on the planet. You know, Christ makes the Father's mercy known. That's what Pope Francis says in the very first line of his opening to the year of mercy. Christ makes the Father's mercy known. And then so the church's job is what? To make Christ known. And how do we do that? By making that mercy known to other people. And then being prepared to say, <laughs> why? You know, why are you such a helpful person? Why do you do this? Why do you visit? Why do you come? Why do you do? Well, now we got that opportunity that I talked about before. Testimony and witness and talking. But even if nobody ever asked us, you know, why do you do what you do? We would still do it because it's what breathes life into our witness and what makes us different than, than just about every other organization in the world. And so I would say if we're sitting down and we're evaluating our parishes and, and we're looking at, you know, pie charts or whatever expression we have for showing how much time we spend doing this, we have to look at it and say, how much time do we spend doing this? in a meaningful way, in a way that's driven by mission, in a way that we, we understand that we must do this with an urgency that perhaps isn't there, you know, a required sense of, 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 wow, 
We have to get to this task. If we can look at that and say, how much time do we spend doing that? I think we'll, we'll have a good handle on this ministry to those in need. Because I think if we're not spending a significant amount of time on that, then, then we're not being the community, we're not being the church that Christ called us to be. And that's the responsibility of our parish. We also individually have this responsibility to minister to those in need. So where are the needs in my life and my family? Where can I be a peacemaker? Where can I be uh, someone who dispenses or gives mercy? Where can I forgive? Where can I forget? <laughs> you know, where can I go and see somebody in need and respond? And I think we have to ask that of ourselves personally as well. If we're, if we're about this, then it's, a, uh, you know, it's a, we're about it personally, then if naturally our communities are going to be about it too. And I think this is so important, this point that the Pope makes, that this mercy, the expression of mercy by individuals and communities that I'm speaking about, he says it's absolutely essential for the church and her message. And why? He says for the credibility of her message. Without this action, our message, our preaching, our testimony, our word has no content. It has no heart, literally, if mercy is the beating heart of the gospel. And so it's absolutely essential for the church's message and her credibility that she herself live and testify to mercy. So in this great Jubilee year, as we focus on mercy, what does it have to do with pastoral planning? What does it have to do with the bishop's pastoral letter? Everything. Because mercy is who we are supposed to be. And it gives life and love to the world, just like God gives life and love to the world, by creating us and by giving us Christ. Amen. The last aspect of mission that the bishop gives us in his pastoral letter is reliance on the Spirit. I was at a meeting not too long ago where somebody said, could you explain what you mean by reliance on the Spirit? And so I had to, and I think it's important to explain for all of us to get. And I think the best way to understand how relying on the Holy Spirit is related to our mission is to look at the birth of the church. Think about the church. You see two churches in, in the gospel. You see the church kind of before she's born. What do you have? You have disciples and apostles locked in the upper room, scared out of their minds. They're praying. They believe in Jesus. You know, they, they have the words of Jesus. Some of them walk the earth with him, but they're locked inside and turned on themselves and worried and afraid and the world is hostile and they don't know what to do and everything is terrible and all of our followers have flittered away and scattered away. And they're turned on themselves. And then at the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and boom, they kick open the doors. I don't know if they kick them open. It doesn't say in the Acts of Apostles. But I imagine St. Peter kicks open the doors and he goes out into the street and he preaches the longest sermon in the history of sermons. And people listen. First miracle of the early church. Second miracle of the early church. They listen. They say they're cut to the heart and they say, what must we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And 3,000 were added to their number on that day. So he did what Jesus commanded. He went and made disciples. He went and proclaimed the gospel. So you have these two images of the church. The church before her birthday on Pentecost. Scared, locked in, turned in on itself. Focused on its own self-interest and its own self-preservation. And you have the church after Pentecost. Alive, out in the world. Read the Acts of the Apostles. It's an amazing action story of, of the church at work in the world. And we see what it looks like and how people are interacting with one another and how it happens. And I think that the point of that is, is the mission is not possible without the grace of the Holy Spirit. And when we do not rely on the Spirit, we don't have the Spirit, we act like that church in the upper room. We're locked in, scared. Yes, we pray. Yes, we believe in Jesus, but we don't want to go out there. And we don't want to draw new people in either. We just, they might hurt us. <laughs> they might close us down. They might do this. They might do that. And so we look a lot sometimes when we're not relying on the Spirit. 
this important aspect of mission, we look sometimes like that early pre-church before the Feast of Pentecost. And reliance on the Spirit allows us to act like the church in the Acts of the Apostles. Gives us the grace necessary to accomplish the mission. In the parlance of the church, that means you know, the Holy Spirit is the primary agent of evangelization. It fortunately does not depend on you and I to give perfect witness and to give perfect testimony and to give perfect proclamation and to always be merciful. Because you know what? Maybe you can do that, but I can't. And it's the Holy Spirit that bridges the gap between our imperfection and what God desires for the world. And so reliance on the Spirit is an important, important aspect of the mission. And I think it's one of those things that separates us from a non-governmental organization. Our work is fueled and powered by the Spirit. That there's, there's a spirituality behind who we are and what we do and why we do it that's absent from any other organization on earth. And that's the Holy Spirit. And it's such an important 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 aspect because without the spirit the church would be in a bad way you know you think it's bad now imagine if there's an old holy spirit holding us together you know these are the things that we need to to really kind of zero in on and focus on when we talk about reliance on the spirit in his letter or apostolic exhortation on the joy of the gospel pope francis talks about it. he dedicates a whole section to spirit-filled evangelizers he kind of develops a missionary spirituality that's that's rooted in the holy spirit and rooted in prayer and he, he talks about, uh, you know, being, being relying on the Spirit and how interesting it is and how <laughs> kind of dangerous it is sometimes, too, to, to rely on the Holy Spirit, to go where the Lord is calling us, to, to be able to see what God is asking and then to go and do it with trust that he'll help us get it done. And he calls this kind of an evangelical discernment, that, that evangelizers would discern at all times where God is calling them to go, trust that he's there, in front of them already and go there. But I mean, that's the title of the pastoral letter, Lord, where are you going? It's ultimately a discernment in evangelization. Where are we now? Where does God need us to be in order for the Holy Spirit to you know, show up in a big way? And this is the element of reliance on the Spirit and this missionary spirituality that Pope Francis builds is really important. And the first key to that min, uh, missionary spirituality is discernment, being open to God's will, Am I open to God's will in my life? Am I constantly discerning God's will in my life? Do, does our parish constantly discern God's will? When we meet, are we discerning what God wants for our community? Or are we saying kind of a prayer at the beginning and the end because you say prayers at the beginning and the end? You know, that's different. That discernment is really important. That's about leading and being led by the Lord and by the Holy Spirit. And we must rely on that spirit as part of our missionary spirituality. Prayer, obviously, is an important part of the missionary spirituality. We must be people in prayer. We must be connected to God if we want to have any hope at all of hearing what he has to say to us and where he might want to lead us. And so prayer is important, but prayer must lead us to action. Prayer can't be upper room prayer that is locked and turned in on itself. It must be empowered by the Spirit and pushed out into the world for the sake of the mission. And so prayer is an essential part of this missionary spirituality and prayer for the Holy Spirit to enliven our actions and to prompt us to action. This missionary spirituality is rooted in the Word of God. The Pope dedicates a whole other section to the, the hearing and listening to the sacred scriptures and responding to the Word of God. So is our decision-making process in our parish, in our lives, is it rooted in the Word of God? Do we spend time listening to what God has to say in the scriptures? Are my allusions to the Acts of the Apostles, are they foreign to you? Did you not know that that happened? You know, if we didn't know that, then we should get familiar with that. If we want to see what a church looks like, we should read the witness of those who went before us. We should listen to the words of Jesus who, who speaks and teaches the church even now. And rooted in the Word of God is how we do that. Both personally and as a community. And then talking about it. Like this art of spiritual conversation. Are we talking to other people? You know, where was the Lord in my life today? Where's the Lord in your life today? That's, that's like a weird conversation. Right? Like people, people don't have that very often, but I think that we need to grow in that art again. And, and that, that art also when we're meeting. Okay, what, what is the Lord saying right now? I was at a meeting recently and it was so much fun because it was a lot of conflict and everybody was fighting and I mean, I love that stuff. And everything's going crazy. And, and then somebody's like, maybe we should just stop and pray. I was like, okay. And we did, you know, and 
people calmed down and settled down, and a, a solution kind of arose, and we went with it, and it seems to be working. So that spiritual conversation is the fruit of our prayer and our discernment and our rootedness in the Word of God. The Pope also talks about the missionary power of intercessory prayer. He says that one form of prayer that's particularly suited to evangelization is mission intercessory prayer because it allows us to seek the good of others. So by intercessory prayer, I mean praying for other people. And we do that a lot in our liturgies. There's no question about it. It's a, it's a part of our liturgies. But do we do it constantly? Do we do it often? Do we do it personally? Do we do it in our meetings? Do we do it in our families? Do we do it in our, in our own prayers? And do we ask that the Lord's will be done? Or do we just ask for what we want? You know, and these kind of things go together. So intercessory prayer is, is powerful and important in terms of transform, transforming us into these missionary communities that we're supposed to be because it allows us to recognize the Holy Spirit goes ahead of us and works in people's hearts before us. So I would say, do we, in our small groups, in our parish uh, meetings, and all these sorts of things, do we pray for others? And do we really, like, mean it? Do we really desire it? And, you know, that old thing, like, somebody comes up to you and says, oh, I'm sick, or my aunt is sick, or something, and you're like, oh, I'll pray for you. You know, and then we probably don't, you know. Maybe I'm heartless. Maybe I'm the only one who doesn't do this. You know, but what if you just said, like, at that time, okay, I'll pray for you. Let's do it right now. You know? And I've done that before, and I've had that done to me, and it's been amazing and scary and wonderful all at the same time. But this reliance on the Spirit, I think, is a key differentiator for us in terms of our mission because we recognize that we are incapable alone of accomplishing this mission. It is only made possible by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. And the more we get in touch with that, the more we rely on that spirit, the more our mission will be a fruitful mission. St. Peter was a bad preacher, but 3,000 people came to be baptized on that day. You know, the Holy Spirit enables things to happen and enables us to do what God has commanded. The next line after the Great Commission, of course, we always leave it out, is, and lo, I will be with you always until the end of the age. I'm sending the Spirit to be upon you to make this mission possible. So let's go make the mission possible by trusting in God, being rooted in prayer, and being missionaries with a spirituality that focuses on the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Dear friends, uh, at the end of this conversation, I would like to uh, just conclude with a few remarks that are focused on the scripture passage which has been underpinning uh, this whole uh, conversation, which is the uh, text of Sunday's Gospel on the Transfiguration of our Lord. As I considered the connection between this moment in Christ's life and our need to become missionaries, I saw the transfiguration as the initial encounter, uh, the grace that transformed not only Jesus, but his disciples. In uh, this mountaintop experience, the disciples saw Jesus uh, for who he really was. And in the process, saw that Jesus was not alone, that he was not working in isolation, that he was actually in continuity with by, and accompanied by Elijah and Moses. To me, this represents these two individuals represent the prophetic vision that is necessary for a mission to be accomplished. It also speaks of what's needed for leadership uh, when we look at Moses. And when we consider and study Moses' leadership, we find there what is necessary for God's people to move out of where they were 
and to move into where the Lord is leading them. The transfiguration tells us uh, that there can be no mission if there is not an initial grasp of what is required. This is the necessary personal transformation, the one that comes when you encounter Jesus Christ personally. Such an experience is, of course, a great one, and it's a wonderful one. And some people, like Peter and the others, would have loved to have stayed up on the mountain. Uh, but you can't stay there. Moses was up talking to God and he got the Ten Commandments and he had to come down the mountain, face what was there and 40 years of running around in the desert. Uh, Jesus had to come down from the mountain and face the cross. And the disciples also had to uh, leave the mountain of transfiguration and walk with Jesus in order to be properly prepared for what would be entrusted to them. Well, friends, this is what hopefully we are also experiencing in these conversations and learning uh, what needs to be done so that we can be effective missionary disciples for the coming years.